time for a mediocre sermon. Y'all ready? <laughs> Barbara's been lecturing me since she started. Zach, give yourself some more credit. And I'm like, well, somebody else has to do it first, right? If you guys don't know me, I'm Zach Lawler. I'm the head pastor here at LHBC. We're so glad you're joining us. We are continuing our series called This is the Book of John. Who's enjoying it so far? All right, I'm enjoying it. That, that means we're going to go book by ver book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the entire book of John. Is anybody else nervous? I'm a little nervous. Lord, help me, Jesus Christ. Today is a very special day because after two weeks of buildup, we are finally going to see the main character of our story, the main character of the world, the main character of the galaxy, a guy we call Jesus Christ. <sighs> that was a lot. I was like, but we're going to see Jesus come into the story today. We're finally going to see some words written in red. Amen. And I'm excited about that. I need some Jesus up in here. Um, but I want to start today with a question to get our hearts and minds in the right place. Are you guys ready? What is the most amazing thing you've ever witnessed in your life? Childbirth? Ooh, that was the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Terrifying. Uh, I'm scarred. I have literal mental scars from two of those births. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> oh. you know, Nancy, you always ruin the punchline of my sermons. Uh, take Nancy's speaking privileges away from her, okay? No more, no more. Um, you guys, what is the most stupendous, spectacular thing you've ever witnessed? I don't know if you guys are like me. You either did one of two things, like Nancy and, and somebody else in the room, you probably thought of something right away that was amazing, spectacular, stupendous, or you were like me, and you're like, I don't know if I've ever really witnessed anything that amazing in my life. Is anybody else like, I'm a really boring person? Throw your hand up. Yeah, Kemper, we know, yeah, right? Like, like uh, some of us need to get out there and live a little bit, amen? We need to shake some things up and see something exciting, see something amazing. However, I will say this, the other day, me and my son, Sean, were walking our two dogs, at nighttime, because if you try to walk your dogs in the daytime here, you and your animals will melt and die. Amen. So we're walking my dogs at nighttime, and me and Sean see something amazing, you guys. We see something spectacular. We see a real-life UFO. And has anybody here ever seen? Uh, don't laugh at me. Don't, don't laugh at me. I didn't wear my tinfoil hat, okay? But we saw a bona fide extraterrestrial spaceship. I'm, I'm not making this up, okay? We're, we're walking along with the dogs, and out of nowhere, the brightest vessel I've ever seen come flying through the sky. Sean, raise your hand if this is true. You were there. Yeah, he was there. Okay, I have a witness. The, the vessel was dark in the middle, and there was two extremely bright lights for protruding from both sides. It was bigger than I've ever seen. It was traveling faster than I've ever seen, and it was making absolutely no noise. Is anybody else creeped out? You've seen that? Okay, cool. We can start a club after. All right, we'll talk later. Okay, so I see this thing come flying through the sky, and to be honest, have you ever had one of those moments where you look at the person next to you like, please tell me you're seeing the same thing I'm seeing right now? Because I had some really old cheese that day, and I thought I might be hallucinating, you know? Am I tripping, you know? And, and Sean's like, no, I am seeing what you are seeing. What is that? And, and we run home, and we tell Shannon, you know, that we saw an alien craft, and she's like, no way, and we're like, way, right? Like, we saw it. It happened. And for the next few days, I told everybody who had listened that I almost got abducted. All right? I'm telling them. They almost got me again. You know? But uh, a couple weeks later, my little brother comes into town. And we're walking my dogs again because my dogs are full of energy. I will tell you why. Because they're two giant furry fur babies, as my wife calls them. You guys might know them as Australian Shepherds. Okay? I wanted a pug. My wife wanted an Australian Shepherd. So we compromised and got two Australian Shepherds. All right? <laughs> Marriage is wonderful. And, and I'm walking her giant fur babies, and, and I'm with my little brother, and this light shows up again. And I'm like, Doug, there it is, the thing I was telling you about. It's, it's the spacecraft, man, you know? And my brother is not nearly as excited as I am. As a matter of fact, he's not shocked at all. And, and I'm, like, irritated with my brother, I'm, and he's like, bro, that's not a UFO. That is not a UFO. And I'm like, bro... It's flying through the sky. We don't know what it is. By very definition, it's an unidentified flying object. Anybody with me? And my brother's like, no, bro, that's a Starlink satellite. Has anybody seen this thing? So Elon Musk ruined my life, and he built these these um, satellites that travel around their low orbit satellites, they actually reflect the sun with their solar panels, so it looks like a UFO and tricks, 
trashy white people like me, right? And it tricks us into thinking it's something spectacular as it flies through the sky in order for dorky kids in the sticks to play Minecraft all night, right, and get satellite internet access. And, and it turns out I didn't really have any amazing story or anything amazing to really share with you guys other than another in invention by Elon Musk. But this got me thinking, you guys, um, to be real, I know some of us might struggle to think about something amazing that's in our lives, so, something that's spectacular that might be in our lives. But I will tell you, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have seen something amazing. If you are a believer in the one who came and lived and died on the cross, you have seen something spectacular take place. Amen. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. I don't want to ruin it, Nancy. We'll talk about it later. Okay. But, but we're going to hop into the Bible today. And I want to tell you what, you guys, we have to start with this problem. You guys should know, For in human history, there was this issue from the garden on that, that people had sinned and they'd been separated from a holy God. And then we see later in the Bible that God sent his law through his prophets to try to separate the Hebrew people from the, those around them. But all the law did was point out how helpless men were to save themselves. We found through the Old Testament that time after time people tried to live perfect, righteous, religious lives and they fail and they fail and they fail. And finally we get the, to the final book, the book of Malachi. A minor prophet writes these, these few chapters, and it's filled with just how far the Hebrew people have come from God, just how deeply they've been failing. And, and we come to the last part of Malachi, and we read this in verse 5. This is God speaking to his prophet. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He, he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Raise your hand if you read that passage before. But here's the crazy part. After this, guys, we get 400 years of silence from God. God gives no prophecy, no correction, no encouragement. 400 years and not another word from God, and we find God's people, the Hebrew people, desperately waiting for the Christ that was to come. And now we're in John 1, and who's showing up? Christ is showing up. And I, I'm super excited about this. Let's hop into John 1. We're going to pick up in John 1, 29. As John the Baptist, a character we talked about last week, uh, gives the testimony of the Christ arriving on the scene. Are you guys ready? Are you guys praying for your pastor? He doesn't really believe in aliens, okay? It was a story. Um, let, me, let, me, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you for your word. I pray that it blesses the hearts, the minds, the souls of the people in this room. I pray that you, you reach the ears that need to hear, God. You open the hearts that are closed, that you transform lives in this place. I pray that people hear your words and not my own. God, speak through me. If I'm in the way, get me out of the way, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen. All right. You guys got your Bibles open? Okay, starting in verse 29, we are going to finish this chapter today. That means I am reading a lot of Bible. Okay, are you guys ready? Yeah. Stay awake. Here we go. Verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Highlight it, circle it, put a star next to it, a smiley face, and an arrow this time. Okay? This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water is that he might be revealed in Israel. Verse 32, then John gave this testimony. I saw the spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the what, church? Oh, salvation is coming. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. This is amazing, you guys. Got to know when I bring up an amazing story at the beginning of the sermon, this is one of the most amazing portions of world history this is a pivotal moment in all of human history we talked about this before the hebrews have been waiting for hundreds of years for the christ to show up they they thought the christ was going to be this huge 
super powerful political figure, a king on a horse that would come and free them from captivity. And what do we hear as our first impression of that king? Does this sound a little less than impressive if we were honest about the the coming Christ? Right? They're expecting a, a king, a, a guy to ride in on a horse, a, a political power to overthrow the Roman government. And what do they get? There's this 30-year-old carpenter walking up, and his cousin's like, hey, that's the guy. That's him. That's the guy we've been waiting for. And I'm sure some people are st- standing there going, no, isn't that your cousin? Right? Isn't that the carpenter from Nazareth? The backwood town that no one's ever heard of, right? And we're going to see this later. One of his own followers is going to go after his city. And here's the crazy thing. He, he wasn't some king-like figure in stature. You guys know that there's actual no ref, like, physical recording of Jesus. Did you guys ever wonder that? Like, why did nobody like, not run home and draw a picture of Jesus or record what he looked like? I will tell you why, because there was nothing impressive about him. You guys know this, that he was actually just a common-looking guy. I don't care what you see on the walls and the Mormon tabernacles, right? He didn't have long, blonde hair and blue eyes. He didn't look like Fabio, all right? There was really nothing that impressive about the physical appearance of Jesus. Let me help you. He looked like a Hebrew man, all right, with rough hands and a sore back, amen? And, and we get the no stories of Jesus as a child except for the one time in Luke 2 when he goes to the temple and his parents lose him. If you're a parent in the room, feel good. Even Jesus' parents messed up, okay? But, but that's the one story we get. And I think the simplest reason that we don't see anything from Jesus for 30 years is he's really not doing anything that impressive. Have you guys thought about that? There's nothing spectacular or super amazing about Jesus' life. Certainly nothing worth writing about. What is he doing? He's building things with his hands, you guys. He is working as a carpenter. And then, bam, he appears on the scene in John 1. And I love how John describes when John says this, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is massive. Remember, the Hebrew people are awaiting this political figure. And, and, and how does John describe Jesus? As a lamb. As a lamb. Did anybody here ever read the writings of the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53? We read, we read that, that there was this lamb that was going to be led to the slaughter. And I will tell you right now, without Jesus Christ, that passage makes no sense. Without him coming to to die and be sacrificed, that whole passage makes no sense. But through Christ, it is fulfilled. Amen? What What a beautiful Old Testament prophecy. But this is crazy. I learned this this week. You guys could write this down. Everywhere in the Old Testament, the lamb is always described as something sacrificial. Something that's going to going to be slaughtered and its blood is going to be given for something to pass over but this is amazing you guys know in the book of revelation is the first time the lamb is described as something triumphant something that'll come and something that'll defeat death and something that'll be victorious and win amen and that is our jesus christ but we go on the reason i came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to whom church israel so john the baptist is pointing the way to christ John the Baptist came baptizing in water and calling for repentance. It's more of a preparatory baptism. But then he says, the one who comes after me will baptize with what church? The Holy Spirit. He he is going to bring about salvation. God says this, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain on is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And this is where we see the end of our testimony about Jesus from John the Baptist. And this is awesome. I want to cover this with you guys. Did you guys see how much was just revealed about Christ in the first chapter of John? We're not even through the entire first chapter of John, and what do we know about Jesus? That Jesus is God, he has always been God, he will always be God, that he took on the flesh of man, that in him is light, and in him is life, and despite all that, his own people don't recognize him and reject him, yet he is the Lamb of God, the one sent to take on all of the sin of himself, of the whole world upon himself. And this is crazy, guys, you know what we call that right there? Call that the gospel. Anybody? The next time you want to deliver the gospel to someone, the next time one of the Jehovah's Witnesses shows up at your door, amen, Jimmy, right? The next time they show up at your door, open John 1 and read the first half of the chapter, drop the mic and walk out of the room, amen? It's going to tell them everything they need to know about who Christ was, what he did, and why he died. Guys, this is so amazing, but have you ever, like, asked a Christian to give their testimony? Have you guys ever, have you ever had to like pull up a chair and grab a cup of coffee because it's going to be a long story? 
You guys ever have that happen? You know, they start from the very beginning. They're like, I was born at a really young age. I was, <laughs> I was really small because I was a baby, you know. And even as a baby, I knew God was going to use me. Hallelujah and amen. But I remember my first trauma. My mom took my binky. Stop all of that, right? Take a page out of John and just tell people, look, it's the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. Forget your story. Talk about Christ. Amen? That's the gospel. We don't need to hear your life story. We need to hear his story. Man, I'm too excited. I need to calm down. So, and now... <laughs> I also need some coffee. All right, we're going to keep going in the Bible because we're going to shift from an introduction of Christ to, to the introduction of his first followers. Are you guys ready? Remember, Jesus came as this lowly carpenter from the sticks. Surely his first followers have to be something better, amen? Not so much. Let's keep going. Verse 35. The next day John was there again with his two disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. There it is again. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Don't you guys love how they just ditched John? They're like, hey, someone better. See you later, right? Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Verse 40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and, had, and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the what, church? Oh, man, that is Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas which means Peter. I love, <laughs> I love how Jesus just walks up and changes people's names. Does anybody see that? Like, who else gets to do that? You know what I mean? Like, what if I baptize people and just change their name as a pastor? Wouldn't that be awesome? Like, I don't really like the name Slater. Your name's Zacchaeus now from now on. How's that sound? Never liked the name Slater. Okay, Zacchaeus, right? If I had that kind of power, that would be amazing. Uh, but they don't give me that kind of authority through the elders. They're really lame, all right? But, but Jesus... Jesus just shows up on the scene and starts changing people's name. Here's the point. He shows up on the scene and starts changing the entire life of his disciples, of those following him. He just shows up and starts changing their name and their entire course and the way they're going to live, what they're going to believe, and what they're going to live and wait for at church, what they're going to die for. Amen? It's so good. And I, and I love this. He says, Jesus looked at him and said, Son, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which means Peter. And you guys know that Peter means rock, a rock. Not like rock, the movie star, but like a literal rock. Partially because he's really stubborn. And secondly, because God's going to use him as this cornerstone of his church, right? So here's what Jesus is doing. I'm not only going to interrupt your life. I'm, I'm going to give you a new purpose. Let's continue in the Bible. Verse 43. I told you you're reading the whole thing. Is anybody else tired? Just me. <laughs> well, thanks for your support. <laughs> they didn't start a timer upstairs, so I'm preaching for an hour, baby. Let's go. All right. How long has it been? No one cares. Verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Circle that, highlight it. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of, how do you say that? Bethsaida? Does that sound right? Sure. Bethsaida? Bethsaida, I have a master's degree, so we're going to say Sadia, okay? Uh, <laughs> Philip from, <laughs> I'm the worst. Philip from uh, found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Get this, here's his response, Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? Other translations say, can anything good come from that place? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me, Nathanael said. Jesus answered him, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. How does Jesus know this? Right, this is amazing. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, or teacher, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? And this is great. Highlight this. You will see greater things than that. 
And then Jesus added, very truly, truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open up and the angels of a God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Of course, that's a reference to God's deity, Jesus' authority. So the next day, Jesus calls another couple guys to follow him, Philip and who else? Nathaniel. From the town of what did we decide it's called? Whatever it is, okay? I'm going to sound really smart. You know what that town's name meant? It means house of fishing or house of fish. Let me translate it for you. In today's terms, we would call this Long John Silvers, okay? <laughs> so, so here's what we find ourselves. This is crazy. I just want to, I just want to remind you where we've come so far. The, the, the long-awaited Christ, this, this king figure they were waiting for, this guy that was supposed to come and overthrow the Romans, this, this, this masterful king person shows up, and what is he? He's, he's a lowly carpenter from the sticks. And then who does he call as his first disciples? A group of fishermen, you guys. From, from a town called House of Fish. And if we hadn't read the rest of the story, who here would be liking, how, how are these guys going to change the world? Would anybody wonder that? A carpenter and a few fishermen. Have you guys ever met any fishermen in your life like career fishermen? Throw your hand up. Okay, I will tell you, when I was in the Coast Guard, we would board ships full of fishermen, and they were some shady characters. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm talking glass eyes and peg legs, some real pirates of people, Okay. I, will, I, I actually had a time where we arrested a few uh, drug smugglers, and they were much nicer than the fishermen I ran into. <laughs> and probably had less felonies. I'm not even exaggerating. So here's the crazy part. God chooses the most random, crazy, like, like fishermen to follow him, and we're left wondering how are these people going to change the world and i have your answer for you through the power of the holy spirit amen through the power and authority that was given to christ through the power and authority of god and i love the response of one of the guys i think it was nathaniel he says nazareth can anything good come from that place i will tell you the best thing that has ever existed came from that place a guy named jesus christ but it made me think of havasu has anybody famous ever come out of havasu you guys Anybody? Anybody famous ever come out of Havasu? Well, I'm kind of famous. I have like 20 views on YouTube. It's not a big deal. But it's the same idea. His, his followers are wondering what, what could possibly come out of a place like Nazareth. And, and here's the amazing part. When they, they get a glimpse and power of the authority of Jesus Christ, this is our first glimpse of his power and authority as he shares that he could somehow see Nathaniel meditating on God's word under a fig tree. So it was seen Nathaniel was probably a Jewish religious man, and they would spend time meditating on God's word, and somehow Jesus saw him there meditating even though he wasn't there. Verse 50, Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. And this is what he doesn't understand, is he's about to watch Christ turn the entire religious world completely upside down, and they were going to be a part of it. Here's the point we need to know, guys. When Christ comes into people's lives, when Christ calls you to be his follower, he's going to turn your entire world upside down. Does anybody in this room understand that? Like, I can tell you as a man and as a pastor, since Christ came into my world, everything about me has changed. Not just my hairline, right? But like my entire existence has changed. The way I, the way I led my marriage, the way I loved my kids, the way I treated people in the neighborhood, the way I responded to my family. Christ has transformed and changed everything everything about me and, and what these believers don't know yet is that god is going to transfer everything um, um transform everything about their lives in just a minute and this is wild you guys these fishermen are going to be called to not only live for christ but they're going to be called to give their lives for christ Every one of these men will either be stoned or beheaded or, or fed to wild animals or crucified upside down. The only one who will survive will be the writer of this book, and he gets boiled in hot oil and, and excluded to an island to die alone. And this is amazing. But I was thinking about this. This is our big idea. How much has your personal life changed since you came to Christ? How much has your existence your world, your life changed since you started walking with Jesus Christ. How much have you transformed since you guys have come to know Jesus? And does anybody remember where they were when Christ first found them? Can anybody in the room think back to the day when Christ first found them? 
You know, I was studying Romans with a, with a group of guys. I won't name them. Jimmy's one of them. <laughs> Anyways, I'm studying the, the book of Romans with these, with these guys, and we, we, got, we get to the point of Romans, I think it's Romans 2 or 3, where he says no one is good, no one seeks God, and, and you start to realize how broken you are, but then there's this beautiful understanding of grace where I picked on a guy in our group who grew up in the church. Anybody here grow up in church? Anybody here spend their entire life in the church? Who here has been worshiping God their entire lives as long as they can know it? Well, good for you. I'm actually really excited for you guys, but here is the beauty of grace, you guys. I knew nothing of Christ my entire life until I was 23 years old. I lived for me. I lived for my sin. I lived for my stubbornness. I lived for things that I thought would fill my soul, and it all left me hollow. But here is the beauty of grace that you and me who grew up in the church, you guys, we're going to stand before Christ, and we're both going to be saved. We're both going to be redeemed. We're both going to live with Christ forever. I won't have a secondary standing in Christ's world because of the things I've done. He's going to forgive it all. Amen, church? So when I say this, when I started this sermon with, have you ever seen anything amazing? Have you ever seen anything spectacular? Have you ever seen anything fantastic? I will tell you, if you've come to Christ, you have seen the most spectacular thing in the universe. You have seen the dead come to life. Amen, church? You have seen the blind give sight. You have seen those who are lost be found. You literally went from death to life when you started believing in Jesus Christ. We should hear an amen and a hallelujah. Amen, church? People, here's what's amazing. We get to see every wonderful, fantastic beauty that is found in Christ as he changes people, as he transforms their hearts, as he moves them from the grave to life. But I was also thinking there's some people in the room. There's some people who walk into church every single Sunday, and the only thing that has transformed about them is where they spend their Sunday morning. When people leave this room, some of us go right back to the life we knew before we started following Jesus. And my hope for those people is that they, as we go through the book of John and hear what Jesus is and who he was and what he did, that he would start to truly transform who you are. I, I pray that you give up the life you've been living for. I pray that you let go of that sin. I pray that you let him transform you. I pray that you let him change your entire existence as you, and your world as you know it because he is worthy and he is worth it. Amen, church? I pray that some of you let go of the things you've been holding on to and let Jesus change everything about who you are. Will you guys pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Christ, I thank you that the man I was so many years ago is not the man I am now. God, I thank you that you came into my world and transformed everything about me just like you changed those first disciples of Lord. God, thank you that you are enough. Thank you that you are good. And thank you that you can change us if we just hand it over to you. It's your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.